right, let's kick off another deep dive. Today we'll be looking at the Feast of Christ the King. Mm. It's a big one in the church. It is, yeah. But not that old, really, right? Right. It's a relatively recent addition to the calendar. So we'll be exploring its origins and significance. Sounds good. We're going to be focusing mainly on this article from the National Catholic Register. Okay. It really delves into Pope Pius the Elysian's encyclical uh, Quas Primus. Right. The document that actually established the feast. Back in 1925. 1925. Which, you know, when you think about it. Yeah. That was a pretty wild time globally. Intense upheaval. Yeah. Lots of change happening. A lot of it not so good for the church. Absolutely. You had the rise of the secular regimes. Right. Really challenging the church's place in society. Exactly. And the article really highlights that tension. Yeah. I see the omen saw a lot of the world's problems back then. Okay. Things like rising nationalism, all the social unrest. Mm -hmm. He saw them as stemming from, well, not just a rejection of Christian morality in general, but a specific rejection of Christ's kingship. Interesting. So it's like... It's a subtle distinction. More than just, like, people being bad? Kind of, yeah. It's like they were rejecting Christ's authority specifically. Okay, I see. That makes sense. And... You know, that's a key point, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. Because Pius the Eckland, he argued that rejecting Christ's kingship, mm -hmm. it wasn't just some theological error. It had real world consequences. Yeah. He saw a direct link between the world turning away from Christ's authority and all these dangerous ideologies popping up. Right. It wasn't just happening in a vacuum. Definitely not. And what I find fascinating is how he responded to all of this. Oh, yeah. He didn't just like issue condemnations or whatever. He took action. He took action. Huh. The Feast of Christ the King was a direct counter move to those secular forces. Bold move. Very bold. It was like he was saying, nope, we're not bagging down. Christ is still king. Yeah, like a declaration. Exactly. And the article, it points out something I thought was really interesting. What's that? Pius VIII's argument for Christ's kingship, it had two parts. Oh. <laughs> he said it was both a metaphorical reality because of Christ's divine perfection. Right and a literal one, based on his humanity actually receiving a kingdom from God the Father. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's easy to, like, gloss over that distinction. Yeah, you just kind of accept it. But I thought it was really insightful. Yeah, it is, because by emphasizing both sides, uh -huh. he shut down anyone trying to say Christ's authority was purely spiritual. Exactly. He was saying, no, this applies to everything. Governments, laws, how we live our lives, literally everything. Everything. Wow. Now, the article doesn't just stay in 1925. Oh. It jumps ahead a few decades yeah. and talks about how Pope Paul, Paul VI moved the feast. Oh, right, to its current spot. Yeah, the last Sunday of ordinary time. Right before Advent. I hadn't really thought about it before. It's a pretty strategic placement when you think about it. It is. It adds another layer to the whole thing, doesn't it? For sure, because by putting it right before Advent, you know, the season of waiting for Christ's coming, mm -hmm. the church is emphasizing that Christ's kingship isn't just some past event. It's a present reality. It shapes our present, our future. Yeah, it's like a call to action almost. Definitely. Which brings us to, I think, the core question of this whole deep dive. All right, lay it on me. What does Christ's kingship mean for us today? Like almost 100 years after Pius XI made this feast. It's a big question. It is a big question. I mean, the world has changed so much since 1925. Oh, look. But in a lot of ways, those challenges Pius XI was responding to. Like what? Secularism, all these ideologies that go against Christian values. Right. Then. They're still around. Maybe even stronger now. It's true. And the article actually brings in some more modern voices to tackle it. Oh, woo. Pope Francis and Bishop Barron. Okay, yeah. They both talk about how important Christ's kingship still is. Pope Francis said in a homily recently mm. that Christ's kingdom, it's not like earthly kingdoms. What did he mean? It's not about power or dominance. But... It's about love and service. Oh, okay. And Bishop Barron... He takes it even further. Really? He says that acknowledging Christ as king, it's not just like an optional extra in our faith. It's essential. It's the core. Yeah. He says without it, our faith loses its foundation, <laughs> its direction. Wow. It becomes meaningless almost. That's a strong statement. It is. So what are we supposed to do with that? Well, the article ends by highlighting Pius Theakis' hope. Yeah. That reflecting on Christ's kingship would lead people to, you know, live better lives. More virtuously. Yeah, and strive for eternal life, which is a beautiful thought. It is. But it also makes me wonder, 
how do we actually live out this kingship in our daily lives? Like, what does it look like to be a subject of Christ the King in the 21st century? That's the million dollar question. It is. And it's something we'll need to explore further. For sure. But before we do that. Okay. I think we should delve a little deeper into the historical context surrounding all of this. You mean why Pius VII felt the need to do this in the first place? Exactly. It'll help us understand the significance even better. Makes sense. So let's jump back in time a bit and see what was going on that led to this. All right, let's do it. Yeah, so like we were saying, the early 20th century, Oh wow. not an easy time for the church. Not at all. The article highlights some uh, specific examples okay. that really bring it to life, you know? Yeah, like what? Well, for instance, the rise of the Soviet Union oh, right. with the Bolsheviks. They were really bad news. They were persecuting religious believers, Yeah, trying to wipe out the church completely. Scary stuff. Really chilling to think about. And it wasn't just like happening way over in Russia either. Right. The article mentions Mexico. Oh, yeah. Much closer to home. Definitely. And they were having this huge conflict with the church. Leading to violence, oppression, the whole nine yards. Awful. And... For Pius XI, this wasn't just like something happening in the background. Right. He saw it as a direct attack. On Christ's kingship. Exactly. He believed these secular regimes. Mm. They were trying to take the authority that belongs to Christ. And he wasn't going to let that happen. He wasn't going to stand by and watch. So instituting the feast of Christ the king. Yeah. It wasn't just some abstract theological thing. No, it was a strategic response. To a real threat. Exactly, a very real threat. Like he was drawing a line in the sand? Yeah, the article even suggests that um, Most. by putting Christ's kingship right at the center. Of the church's life, liturgically. <laughs> yeah, Pius XI was trying to like... Embolden Catholics. Yeah, embolden them, equip them. To resist these anti-Christian forces. To stand up and fight back. Which makes me think, uh, what does it mean for us today to resist these forces? I mean, we're not facing that same kind of persecution. Not exactly, no. But there's still pressure, right? Oh, absolutely. To conform. To fit in. To this secular worldview that doesn't always uh, mesh with our faith. That clashes, yeah. You're right, the battleground's different. The battle's still going on, though. It is, and it's like... Like what? We don't get thrown in jail for our beliefs. Right. But there's this pressure to... I don't know. To keep your faith private. Yeah, like it's something to be ashamed of. Keep it out of public life. Exactly. But what? the article reminds us that Pleistia Lentha saw Christ's kingship as applying to everything. Not just our private lives. Not just that, every part of life. So then how do we live that out today? Yeah, how do we bring Christ's kingship into our families, our work, our communities, everything? It's a tough question. It is a tough one. But the article hints at a few approaches. Like what? Well, it emphasizes how Pius XI believed that acknowledging Christ as king, yeah. it should lead to a more virtuous life. And so not just following the rules. It's deeper than that. It's like an inner change. Yeah, an inner transformation that then shows up in how you act. I see. So it's about letting our understanding of Christ's kingship affect how we treat others, how we make decisions, how we use our time and money. All of it, yeah. Basically every aspect of our life. Exactly. It's about embodying those values of Christ's kingdom. Love, compassion, justice, all of that. Mm -hmm. Mercy, forgiveness, the whole package. Even when it's hard. Especially when it's hard. Even when it goes against the grain of what everyone else is doing. Especially then, that's when it matters most. And you know, that brings us back to... By what? The feast being right before Advent. Oh, yeah. It's like they work together, those two seasons. To give us a fuller picture of what it means to live under Christ's kingship. It is kind of beautiful when you think about it. It is. Advent is all about waiting, preparing. Getting ready for the king. Exactly. But the Feast of Christ the King. Yeah. It reminds us that this waiting isn't passive. We're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs. It's active. We're supposed to be building his kingdom now. Making the path straight for him. So it's not just about looking forward to Christ coming back at the end of time. Right. It's also recognizing that his kingdom is already here. Breaking in. And we have a part to play in making it real. It's both, you know? Both what? We celebrate Christ's kingship now. In his incarnation, his life, death, and resurrection. But we also work toward the fullness of his reign. When he comes back in glory. It's a beautiful tension. It does give you both a sense of urgency yeah. and hope. You've got limited time to make a difference. But you're not alone in doing it. You've got a king who's already won the victory. Powerful stuff. It is. And as we think about how to live 
as subjects of Christ the King today, mm -hmm. we can't forget, you yeah. know, we're not just called to individual piety. Pius the Evident wanted this feast to have social implications too, right? Absolutely. He believed that acknowledging Christ as King should lead to a more just society. More compassionate, more peaceful. All of that, yeah. So it's not enough to just go to Mass on Sunday and then forget about it the rest of the week. No, nope. you got to bring those values into every part of your life. Work for justice, help the marginalized, build a culture of life and love. Make Christ's heart visible in the world. It's starting to sound like a call to action. It is a call to action. So what can we actually do? What does it look like to build Christ's kingdom in the 21st century? Like, yeah. practically speaking. That's the question, isn't it? And it deserves some serious thought. It does. But before we get into specifics... Yeah. Maybe we should take a step back. Look at the big picture. Reflect on what we've learned so far. We have covered a lot of ground. We have. Maybe we need a minute to let it all sink in before we move on. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. I think you're right. Taking a step back is good here. Yeah. Like you said, we've covered a lot. Yeah. And what really sticks with me is how this feast, mm. it's both like yeah. deeply historical. Rooted in the past. But also super relevant to us now. Totally. It's like this bridge between then, now, and the future. It connects everything. And, you know, we talked about how Pius the Alec created this feast. Yeah, to address those specific problems back then. But that core message. About Christ's authority. Yeah, over everything. It still matters. It still resonates big time. For sure. And I keep thinking about what Bishop Barron said. About accepting Christ as king being the essence of being Christian. Yeah, that's huge. It is. It means it's not just about rituals or activism or whatever. It's deeper. It's about surrender. Giving yourself over. Reorienting your whole self, like your heart and mind. To Christ. So as we wrap up this deep dive. Okay. I'm wondering, what does that actually look like? Embracing Christ's kingship in the 21st century. You know, like for our listener... You know, practically speaking. There's not one answer, obviously. Right. Everyone's different. Different vocations, circumstances. Talents. But the article does give us some clues, right? It, it does. It emphasizes that Christ's kingship, it's not about worldly power. It's not about force. It's about love. Service humility. So we're not trying to, like, impose our beliefs on people. Or take over the government. Yeah, yeah nothing like that. It's more about... Reflecting Christ's love in your relationships. Yeah, serving others. Working for justice. Peace. Wherever you are, whatever you do, exactly. doing it all with humility. Recognizing that ultimately we're just instruments. In Christ's hands. Not in charge of everything. Not trying to save the world on our own. It's freeing, actually. It is. You're not carrying that weight. You're just being faithful. To the king. Doing your part. And when we do that. When we live out Christ's kingship in our lives. We become those signs of contradiction. In a world that's kind of lost its way. We become those beacons of hope. Showing people a different way to be. A different way to live, to organize society. It's a beautiful thing. It is. And it's not just about receiving grace. You're participating. Yeah. We're actively building a better world. One that reflects Christ's values. Love, justice, mercy, peace. It all comes back to that. Powerful stuff. This feast isn't just a one-day thing. No, it's a way of life. A call to discipleship. Embodying Christ's kingship in every moment. Every interaction, every choice you make. It all matters. Well, this has been great. It has. I hope it's given you, our listener, a lot to think about. As you continue on your own journey of faith. May you be inspired to really embrace the kingship of Christ in all its fullness in your own life and in how you engage with the world it changes everything until next time keep exploring keep questioning and keep seeking truth <laughs>